page 69. Explanations Page numbers given here are from the Arden Shakespeare, edited by Kenneth Moore. 1. Fair is foul and foul is fair. Next line. Hover through the fog and fill the air. From Act 1, Scene 1, page 4. These lines occurring as they do in the first scene of the first act strike the keynote of the play Macbeth. These lines are uttered by the witches. The witches are personified forces of disorder and conflict. They meet in thunder and lightning in a desert place and hover through the fog and fill the air. They speak in enigmatic language. They resolve to meet again on the heath when the battle is lost and won. They respond to cats and toads. They choose to meet and move in thunder, lightning and rain. The weather that would be foul to others is fair to them. The witches are indeed the anomalies of nature. They are again mystery personified. They vanish into thin air with their last enigma about fair being foul and foul being fair. These lines illuminate the character of the witches. They are, quote, the lawless of human nature, unquote. This is Coleridge's phrase in back, within brackets. To them fair is foul and foul is fair. Evil is their good. They have pulled down all moral and aesthetic distinctions. These parting words of the witches indicate the special character of the play right from the beginning. They introduce us to a topsy-turvy world where values are perverted and reversed. The Macbeth world is a strange one where, quote, good things of day begin to droop and rouse and night's black agents to their praise to rouse. Within quotes. Word notes. Fair is foul and foul is fair, which means what is fair to others is foul to the witches and vice versa. Hover. Come and go through the air. 2. In fortune on his damned quarrel smiling, ellipsis, next line, till he faced the slave. Act 1, Scene 2, page 6, 7. A bleeding captain comes to the camp of Duncan to report on the battle between Duncan's army and the rebel army of Macdonald. Macdonald. The captain gives a vivid description of Macbeth's exploits in the battle. Macdonald was supplied with light-armed and heavy-armed Irish infantry. At the first, sorry, at first fortune smiled on the rebel. Fortune, like a faithless woman, sided with the rebels. Fortune thus proved to be the mistress of the rebel. She lent her support to an unjust cause, but the favours of fortune were of no avail. Macbeth's valour proved more efficacious. He despised fortune, and waving his sword, which reeked with fresh blood, he made his way through the serried ranks of the rebel army and confronted the slave, the rebel Macdonald. Macbeth was the favourite of valour. This speech by the sergeant is meant for exalting Macbeth. It is Shakespeare's purpose to enlist the sympathy and admiration of the audience in favour of Macbeth so that his ruin may be tragic. Macbeth's courage and heroism are emphasised here. Word Notes Damned quarrel means unjust cause of quarrel. The folio reads quarry, Q-U-A-R-R-Y within quotes, meaning, quote, best slain in haunt, unquote. Rebels whore, within quotes whore, means mistress, not the lawfully wedded wife. Fortune is called the mistress of the rebel because she has espoused a wrong cause. Brandished steel means waved sword. Steel here means sword. 
Material is used to indicate the thing made. In brackets, synecdoche. S y n e c t o c h e. Page seventy, number three. As sparrows, eagles, or the hare, the lion, ellipses, doubly redoubled strokes upon the four. Act one, scene two, pp seven eight. These lines occur in the second scene of the first act of Macbeth. The surgeon here describes to Duncan. The heroic achievement of Macbeth and Banquo. The surgeon says that it was expected that the defeat of Macdonald would bring peace and comfort, but actually, fresh troubles cropped up at this time. The King of Norway chose to make his raid precisely at the moment when Macbeth and Banquo had overthrown Macdonald with great courage and strength. Duncan asks the surgeon. Whether Macbeth and Banquo were not frightened by this fresh recrudescence of trouble, the surgeon answers ironically that they were frightened. They were frightened just as sparrows frighten the eagle and the hare, the lion. Thus, Macbeth and Banquo are compared to the eagles and the lions, and the king of Norway was the sparrow and the hare. The two generals were like cannons. Charged with double shots, they began to deliver blows after blows upon their enemies like cannons loaded with double charges. In other words, they attacked their enemies with redoubled force, like cannons loaded with double ammunition. Word notes: As sparrows, ellipses the lion. They were as little frightened by this renewed attack as eagles might be by sparrows or lions by hares. Cracks means discharges. Overcharged ellipses cracks. That is, quote, filled with charges powerful enough to give a doubly loud report. Unquote. Within brackets, Oxford and Cambridge edition. Brackets closed. Doubly redoubled. This is a typically Shakespearean expression. Richard II has, quote, blows doubly redoubled, unquote. Strokes means attacks. Number four. Till that Bellona's bridegroom, ellipses, his lavish spirits. Act One, Scene Two, Page Nine. These lines occur in Act One, Scene Two of Macbeth, and are said by Ross in the course of describing the heroic exploits of Macbeth. Ross here confirms the surgeon's report of Macbeth's heroic and courageous action in quelling the revolt of the King of Norway against Duncan. Ross relates the news of their victory over the King of Norway. The banners of Norway were defiantly fluttering in the air and mocking the sky. Duncan's soldiers were cold with alarm. The King of Norway was assisted secretly by the Thane of Cawdor. Then Macbeth appeared on the scene, and the tables were turned. Macbeth confronted the King of Norway, point against point, arm against arm. It was a sword-to-sword and arm-to-arm encounter, a stiff and determined fight between the two. At the end, Macbeth succeeded in checking the rebellious spirit of the King of Norway. The report by Ross is another dramatic method employed by Shakespeare for glorifying the character of Macbeth. Macbeth is exalted as the bridegroom of Mars, Roman goddess of war. Thus, Shakespeare succeeds in his dramatic purpose of enlisting the sympathy and admiration of the audience in favor of Macbeth. It may be noted that Ross is describing the scene in the historic present. We have the two accounts of the fight by the surgeon and Ross. The surgeon gives his report of the fighting more from imagination than from observation. 
Ross's description is more precise in details. It has to be admitted that Shakespeare is not concerned with the battle as such. He is concerned with the battle in so far as it throws light on the situation and the character. Wilson Knight makes a pertinent remark on this point. He says that in spite of the two accounts of the fighting, quote, the whole matter of the rebellion is vague to us, unquote. Shakespeare means it to be vague. This vagueness contributing to the impression of total vagueness, quote, blurring and lack of certainty, unquote, which is an essential feature of the play. Page 71 Percival notices that, quote, the elegant effusion, sorry, quote, the elegant euphemism of the patrician courtier that is Ross is a contrast to the bungling attempts at fine language made by the plebeian sergeant unquote. word notes Bellona's bridegroom that is Macbeth Bellona is a Roman goddess of war or Mars lapped in proof Dressed in strong armor, proof against attack. Lap is etymologically the same word as rap, W-R-A-P. R and L sounds are close cousins. With self-comparisons, that is, with courage, with equal courage and skill. This is a quote from Arden. Confronted, encountered. Lavish spirit means unrestrained, rebellious spirit. 5. But it's a strange in deepest consequence. Once again, number 5. But it is strange. Ellipsis in deepest consequence. This is from Act 1, Scene 3, page 20. These words are said by Banco to Macbeth when the latter is excited at the fulfillment of two prophecies, prophecies within quotes. He has become Thane of Glamis and Thane of Corda. Temptation assails him and is agitated at the thought that the greatest prophecy, within brackets, about his kingship is yet to be fulfilled. He asks Banco if he is not elated at the thought that his children shall be kings. That is the prophecy made about Banco by the witches. Banco dismisses the witches as bubbles of the earth. He says to Macbeth that if the latter believes them completely, that will incite him to look longingly for the crown of Scotland. These witches are ministers of Satan, agents of evil. They will excite us into wrong actions which will ultimately harm us. They gain our confidence with little things that come true in order to betray us in serious consequences. Banco is a foil to Macbeth. Macbeth is serious. His words are agitated and emotional. He is excited at the fulfillment of two prophecies. Banco's tone is amused and light. He is full of misgivings in his mind about the predictions. While Macbeth yields to temptation, Banco puts himself on his guard against any possibility of being tempted. Macbeth jumps to the horrifying thought of murder. Banco is skeptical and mocking. Banco shows his wonderful restraint and strength of mind. He is here more heroic than Macbeth, who has curbed, quote, the lavish spirit, unquote, of the king of Norway. Macbeth is oppressed with ambition and jealousy. He accepts the words of the witches as gospel truths. He is jealous of Panko, whose children shall be kings according to the prophecy of the witches. But Panko resist the, resists the temptation and tries to overcome it in these lines by discussing the witches as agents of evil. Word notes. Instruments of darkness are dark spirits or ministers of Satan. 
honest trifles, little things that are true. Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. Number 6 My thought, whose mother yet is but fantastical, next line ellipsis, but what is not. Act 1, Scene 3, page 21 These lines are said by Macbeth when two of the prophecies of the witches were fulfilled. The witches have told two truths. Macbeth thinks that their third prophecy may also come to be true. He is completely lost in his thoughts. He says to himself, If the prophecies are evil, why are they fulfilled? If good, why does he tremble at the very temptation of winning the crown? The fulfillment of two truths has given him earnest of success. He is tempted to the idea of mother. The temptation takes a definite form. Quote, a horrid image, unquote, of murdering Duncan. The very thought of murdering Duncan causes his hair to stand on end and his seated heart to be unseated. Page 72 in his thought, mother is yet a fancy, a shadowy idea. Yet the mere thought of mother, which exists faintly in his imagination, shakes so violently his whole physical and mental faculties that his capacity for action is lost in speculation. Nothing exists for him except what is not the future. The present for him is unreal. The future alone is real. He is interested only in kingship. The speech shows that Macbeth has already thought of murdering Duncan, but his good nature recoils. Number 7 There is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. This is from Act 1, Scene 4, page 23. Duncan says this to Malcolm when the latter gives him an account of the death of faithless Corder. The Thane of Corder was guilty of treason as he had assisted the King of Norway in his revolt against Duncan. Duncan ordered execution on Corder. Malcolm reports that Corder gave a better account of himself on the eve of his death than he had ever done before in his life. He died like one trained carefully in the art of dying. Nothing in his life was as becoming, as dignified, as his way in which he faced death. Duncan confessed that he had built an absolute trust on him. He had put implicit faith in him, but he was most deceived. There is no art that can teach one how to read man's mind in the face. The face is never the index of the mind. Duncan was deceived by the apparent trustfulness of Corder. These words by Duncan are full of ironical significance. Duncan was deceived by Corder and he will be deceived also by Macbeth. Just as he has built his, just as he had built his absolute trust on Corder, so he will choose Macbeth and Lady Macbeth as fit persons to trust and here he will be fatally deceived. He will quote his death. These lines underline the fatal flaw of Duncan's character, his blind trustfulness. Again, these words indicate one underlying theme of the play, the sin of ingratitude and the tragedy of unsuspecting trustfulness. As a matter of fact, the whole scene that follows is steeped in irony. Word notes. Construction means expression. Quote, Yet do I fear thy nature, ellipsis, what thou wouldst highly. This is from Act 1, Scene 5, pages 27-28. These lines are said by Lady Macbeth after she has read the letter of Macbeth and thus known of the witch's predictions. She has no doubt that he will be king. She has thought too of the shortest way to the throne. But she has misgivings about her husband's nature. She is afraid 
that her husband will not be equal to the task. Her husband is soft and cowardly by nature. He will hesitate to take the easiest way to gain the throne. Not that he despises the crime, but he is frightened by it. He fears the act, that is, the act of murder. But he very much covets the result. Macbeth has ambition that he will not adopt the only means and hazard the inconveniences incidental to it for realizing his ambition. For Lady Macbeth, the only means for fulfilling the ambition is that of mother. It is inconvenient, but since it is the shortest means, it has to be accepted. But Macbeth covets the thing, but he will have it by holy means. But that this is absurd. According to Lady Macbeth, if you wish a thing, you must have it by any means, most preferably by evil means, because that is the shortest one. One should not make a fetish of the means in order to obtain the object of ambition. Moreover, Macbeth has no real objection to evil means, but he will not himself adopt it. He will enjoy the result, but he will not suffer the risk. Thus, according to Lady Macbeth's estimate, Macbeth does not object to crime because it is crime, but because it is full of peril. Lady Macbeth's estimate of Macbeth's character is totally wrong. Lady Macbeth charges Macbeth with cowardice. He shrinks from murder because of nervous fear, of dread of consequences. This is far from truth. Macbeth, Macbeth's shrinking, his hesitation and recoiling from murder proceed from conscience. It is conscience which makes a coward of him. Page 73 Word Notes Milk of Human Kindness The phrase suggests cowardice and softness. This is a very typical phrase of a woman. This undermines the lurking woman in Lady Macbeth who appears to be a fiend. Catch thy nearest way to take the easiest course, to take the shortest way. Illness is inconveniences or risk. Thou wouldst highly. Thou wish the very thing very much. What thou wouldst highly means you want to do it by holy means. 9. Hide thee hither. Next line. That I may pour my spirits. Ellipsis. To have thee crowned withal. Act 1, Scene 5, page 28 These lines are said by Lady Macbeth when she has read the letter of Macbeth and had known of the witch's predictions. Lady Macbeth makes an analysis of her husband's character. She describes him as one who is soft and cowardly by nature. He has ambition, but he shrinks from the means necessary for realizing the ambition. He is unwilling to face the risk that the realization of ambition involves. He does not object to crime as crime, but he objects to it because it is dangerous. He fears the act, but very much covets the thing. So according to Lady Macbeth, Macbeth shrinks from evil means because of his nervous fear of the dread of consequences. Lady Macbeth, however, hopes to tune him to the deed. He, she will pour her spirits in his ear. She will pour her spirits in his ear and drive away his weakness. She will rebuke him for his scruples in such a way that all his weaknesses and cowardice will be driven away. She knows that her tongue is sharp and her words will be pointed. She will rebuke him for his scruples in such a way that all his weaknesses and cowardice will be driven away. She knows that her tongue is sharp and her words will be pointed. They will penetrate his heart and cure him of his cowardice. She is confident that her taunts and reproofs will produce the desired effect on Macbeth. Thus, all fears and scruples that stand in the way of his having the crown will be banished from his mind and he will gain the crown 
that fate and supernatural power have already given him. To Lady Macbeth, Macbeth is already crowned by fate and supernatural power. Now Macbeth will have to stir a little in order to get the crown in his hand. Lady Macbeth shows here her imperious will and indomitable confidence. It is her imperious will that regards the future to be already present. And with her unshakable faith, she thinks that she will succeed in curing Macbeth of her scruples and fears. Lady Macbeth shows here her power of anticipating the recoilings of Macbeth. As soon as she has got the letter of Macbeth, she has made up her mind as regards her role that she will play in making Macbeth ready for the deed. She knows that it is by murder that the throne has to be gained. But Lady Macbeth knows only the surface of Macbeth's mind. She can foresee the recoilings and hesitations of Macbeth, but she has no understanding of the deeper spring of Macbeth's behavior. Word Notes my spirits. Lady Macbeth is conscious of her heroic spirit and co courage. In brackets, of course, Lady Macbeth overestimates her own spirits. Bracket closed. Chastise means rebuke and drive away. All that impedes, I M P E D E S, means all fears, fancies, and scruples that prevent you from getting the crown. Golden round means the crown. Seam, S -E, e M. Macbeth seems to have been already crowned. For seam within quotes, another reading is seek within quotes. But this is not happy. Page 74. Fate and metaphysical aid. Good luck and the aid given by supernatural powers, that is, the witches. Number 10. Come to my woman's breasts. Ellipsis. Hold. Hold. Act 1, Scene 5, page 31. This is from Lady Macbeth's soliloquy, which she utters after she has read the letter of Macbeth about the witches' predictions and the royal visit to their castle. She has made up her mind about the mother. She has quickly planned the murder of Duncan when he comes to visit their castle. She knows the weakness of her husband and she therefore instantly chalks out the program for carrying out the murder. She knows that she will have to play a very terrible role. On the one hand, she will have to tune her husband to the deed and on the other, she will have to work out the details as regards how to compass the murder. At the same time, she knows her own weakness too. She feels diffident and unsure of herself. She requires strength of will to tune herself to the terrible role that she has to play. So, she calls upon the spirits who help murderers to convert her milk into gall or bitterness. From a woman, she wants to be changed to a cruel murderer. She solicits their help to fill herself with terrible cruelty. She is afraid that her essential womanly nature, her scruples and compassion, may make her hesitant about the deed. She asks them to come to her in their invisible forms in order to help human nature do the deeds of mischief. She appeals to Black Knight to come covered with the darkness, sorry, with the darkest smoke of hell so that even her knife cannot see the wound that it inflicts upon Duncan, and heaven may not see through the thick covering of darkness and prevent her from the unnatural deed. This invocation to murdering ministers indicates the essential womanliness of Lady Macbeth. If she had been naturally cruel and ruthless as she wanted to be to rise to the occasion, that has come up with the predictions of the witches and the ensuing visit of Duncan to their castle, she would not have felt the necessity of this appeal. This shows, therefore, that she is a woman after all, that she shares the normal weakness of her sex 
and that she knows the compunctious visitings of nature which may shake her fell purpose this suggestion of the essential womanliness of lady macbeth is dramatically relevant as it prepares us for the sleep walking of lady macbeth the compunctious visitings of nature completely shakes her quote single state unquote word notes murdering ministers are agents of murder ministers etymologically means servants here it means spirits that incite one to murder take my milk for gall change my mother's feelings into feelings of bitter hatred gall g a l l means poison lady macbeth is conscious of a motherly tenderness which she wants to smother for the exigencies of the situation sightless substances means invisible forms the spirit that quote tend on mortal thoughts unquote are invisible but they come to scenes of murder and crime and abet nature's mischief wait on that is help or abet nature's mischief within quotes all that is cruel in the operations of nature unquote in brackets verity v e r i t y brackets closed paul is to cover darkest is darkness sorry is darkest blanket of the dark covering of darkness some critics particularly 18th century critics object to the word blanket within quotes and amend it as blankness blackness but the word is homely and it is natural for lady macbeth to use it the elizabethans were bold to use quote small pieces of robust homespun imagery unquote bradley comments quote blanket is ominously suggestive of a mother in bed unquote grierson remarks quote with her as with macbeth tensest excitement sometimes vents itself in homely even colloquial phrase unquote